Okay, smile, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to run this through some facial recognition software. <laughs> if you're not paying attention, I will know. No, I'm not really going to do that. You're fine. What I am going to do is put this on Twitter right now. <laughs> Hashtag transition 2015. <laughs> and what I've just done is given you a great excuse to look at your phone while I'm speaking. <laughs> Nobody will ever know. We have really bad reception in here, huh? That's, uh, that's going right now. So that's a pretty amazing piece of technology. Or it would have been five years ago, right? I took this thing out of my, my pocket. We call it a phone, which is a lie. It is not a phone. If you think about how much time you spend using that device and how much of the time you're actually on a phone call, it's like minimal, right? It's about um, 20 times more data coming through the smartphone network than, uh, than voice, if not more. Uh, but five years ago, it would have been miraculous. Today, it's, we just take it for granted. I just took a picture of you all. It's, the world is looking at you right now. No big deal. Um, and when we think about technology, that can be what we think about, you know, the latest, shiniest thing. And very quickly, te technology stops being technology. It just becomes, I don't know, stuff. Um, so I want to talk about how technology is made, I guess. Um, and we'll have, a, we'll have a specific example. So um, let's, let's start here. Take one eight meter high self-driving truck. That's what this is. We have a whole fleet of them made by a Japanese company called Komatsu. Um, take that and strip mine the ground in Western Australia. And the stuff you dig out, separate it out. Get rid of this stuff, this red stuff, make a big lake of it. Um, and you'll be left with this. Looks a bit like mints. Do not eat these, okay? <laughs> um, combine these with a rare mineral that uh, was originally discovered in this tiny village in Greenland. Put the result onto a container ship bound for the United States. It's like a cooking show, right? We've just put something into the oven. So now we need, now we can prepare, you know, another part of the course. Um, so while the ship is traveling, um, let's go to, I don't know, let's say an island off the east coast of Africa and look for this orchid. You will know you found it if you find a flower that looks like this. And if you're really lucky, hanging underneath the flower will be some fruit. Looks kind of like a green bean. Pick the fruit. Cure it on a woolen blanket for about three months. After three months, massage it a little, uh, and then split it open, scrape out the seeds. Head to Sri Lanka. Look for this tree, or a tree a lot like it. Um, scrape away the outer bark until you get to the inner bark. Scrape the inner bark, let it dry out. It will turn into sort of quills, dried quills. Looks a bit like this. Meanwhile, turn the stuff on the container ship into something that looks like this. Oh, go to Iowa. There's only two reasons to go to Iowa. Either you want to be president, <laughs> or you need some corn. 
Maybe that's the same thing. Um, <clears throat> make the corn wet and then grind it up in one of these machines. When you have ground the corn up, um, take a rod-shaped bacteria, get the enzymes out of the rod-shaped bacteria, mix that in with the wet milled corn. Take this fungus, get some enzymes out of this fungus, mix that in too. Or you'll end up with something sticky and gooey. But that's good. Now, head from Iowa to South America. Get some leaves. Take them to this particular factory in New Jersey. Have some of the more potent chemicals removed from your leaves. Head back towards Africa, grab some of these nuts. I hope you're taking notes. <laughs> Mix the juice from these nuts with the extract from the leaves and the sticky stuff and the bark of the tree and the seeds from the pod that you got from the orchid in the East African island. Take the stuff you put on the container ship and shape it so that it looks like this. Add water to your mixture. Use a nanoscale comestible polymeric coating on the inside of the metal before adding water and the other ingredients into, into the can. Put a lid on that looks like this, and congratulations, you've just made a can of Coca-Cola. It has taken you about a year. You have traveled all over the world. You now have something you can sell for about 50 cents. Now, our theme this afternoon is the connected world. And I think we can get very enamored with the information age and with the ability to take panoramic high definition photographs and put them on Twitter using the device in our pocket and so on. Um, and it can feel like the connected world is a new thing. The reason I wanted to tell you the story of how Coca-Cola is made is I think it's an example of how the world has been connected for a very, very long time. We have always lived in a connected world. And there's an interesting reason why. We live in a connected world so we can create. The thing that's unique about human beings is not the fact that we use tools. It is the fact that we make our tools better consciously. A bird's nest is a tool. A beaver's dam is a tool. The more we look at animals, actually, the more we find there are a large number of animals, a minority, but a large number of animals that use tools. But the difference is, if you take a bird nest from 10,000 years ago and the nest of the same bird today, it has not changed. There isn't like a meeting every six months where a bird in a black turtleneck strolls around a stage and says, <laughs> Bird's Nest 6, we think you're going to love it. Um, the bird's nest is a product of instinct, like the beaver dam. Um, and until about, I don't know, 
somewhere between 50 and 250,000 years ago. Tools used by human beings were also products of instinct. They didn't change, literally, for millions of years. Um, but gradually, as we develop the capability to think symbolically, which is what language is, by the way. Language is primarily a tool for thinking, not a tool for talking. Um, we develop the ability to manipulate our tools and change our tools during our own lifetime, to think about them and improve them. Um, but if you want to think about and improve your tools, what you actually need are resources from all over the place. You know, the things that are available to you locally may not be what you need to improve your tool. So what comes with this sophisticated, creative behavior that is uniquely human um, is the need to form connections and networks. Um, both networks of things, like, oh, you have something over there I can use to improve my tool over here. Um, but also networks of ideas, of, of, of recognizing something that somebody else has invented could be useful to something you're trying to invent, and so on. So this connected world that we live in, that is so essential to our survival, is intimately related to our instinct to create. Um, and you know, let's, let's talk about that, because the story I just told you was kind of spatial connection, okay? We had something in Sri Lanka and something else in East Africa and something in South America. We, we put them all together and we ended up with um, you know, this so-called ordinary, so-called everyday product, which is actually an amazing accomplishment. Um, but these connections aren't just spatial, they're also temporal. They, they, we're connected through time there's been about 2,000 generations of human being, and every generation has contributed many, many things to everything we experience today. So if you take, uh, take the can of Coke, um, this is people called the Olmecs. They lived in uh, what is now Mexico, the east coast of, of Mexico in a place called Pablanta, uh, about five to 10,000 years ago. And you know, the, the thing about scraping the pods that I started with, well, that's, that's vanilla. The principal flavorings in Coca-Cola are vanilla and cinnamon. And the, the first thing I talked about was vanilla. Vanilla is the dried fruit of an orchid. Not a lot of people know that. Um, it's the only edible orchid in the world. Um, and the people who figured this out were these people. And that's because the vanilla orchid is only native to the part of Mexico that they live in. And somehow they found a way to cure the fruit and turn it into this delicious spice, which was primarily used in chocolate. When the Aztecs came and took them over, they paid the Aztecs taxes in vanilla and never told the Aztecs what vanilla was or how it was made, and that's how they protected themselves. Um, but There's a problem, which Darwin was one of the first people to write about. So the, the Spanish took over South America and discovered vanilla and really liked it and brought it back to Europe. Um, and the royalty of Europe fell in love with vanilla. Um, around the same time, by the way, there was a man in Paris um, called Thomas Jefferson who found a way to put vanilla in frozen cream. And when he came back to the United States, he shared with everybody his recipe for vanilla ice cream. Every time you have vanilla ice cream, think of Jefferson. But the problem that Darwin was one of the ones trying to address was the Europeans could not get the vanilla orchid to bear fruit in any part of their empire. In Darwin's time, in Jefferson's time, all the vanilla in the world came from this tiny region in Mexico. You could take the plant, you could grow the plant, you could even get it to flower. In Europe, in Africa, in India, but it would never fruit. And nobody understood why. 
And in these, those days, botany was kind of a mystery and no one really understood how flowers reproduce. But Darwin hypothesized that there must be some special kind of insect in this part of Mexico that pollinated the vanilla orchid. And he was right, but we only discovered that insect about 20 years ago. It's a special green bee, and it only lives in the part of Mexico where the vanilla orchid is found, and it, it pollinates the orchids, and that's what causes them to bear fruit. Um, but without the bee, how do you farm the orchid outside of Mexico? How do you meet this massive growing demand for vanilla that's, that's rising up in Europe and, and with Jefferson bringing back vanilla ice cream in the Americas as well? Well, the answer to that question came in the 1800s on a tiny African island about a thousand, well, it's a French island, a thousand miles east of Africa. It's called Réunion today. You may have heard of it because uh, a piece of an aircraft washed up there a few weeks ago and it made the news. Um, Réunion is a French colony. The French, like all the, uh, all the other European empires, were trying to find a way to grow vanilla. They took some there. Uh, it did not fruit until a 13-year-old slave boy called Edmund. Slaves did not have last names. Edmund was the first person to figure out how to manually pollinate vanilla. Um, and the way he did it was by taking a toothpick and separating the part of the plant that prevents self-fertilization and self-fertilizing. And because of him, all the vanilla on Réunion bore fruit. And with a few years' time of him making this discovery, Réunion was this massive exporter of vanilla. Until the island to the west of Réunion, Madagascar, figured out what Edward had figured out, or learned it from Edmund, had learned it from him. Um, and they started making vanilla too. And now most of the vanilla you get comes from Madagascar. If you look at a jar of vanilla essence, it will say Madagascar Bourbon Vanilla. Bourbon is the previous name of Réunion. Um, and most, most vanilla farmed in the world today uses Edmund's technique. Major innovation from a 13-year-old slave. Um, the other thing, the bark that I mentioned, that's cinnamon. Um, I won't go into detail about that other than to say that for the longest time, like thousands of years, um, cinnamon was thought to be the twigs from the nest of the cinnamon bird. <laughs> and that, that is because the Arabic traders who traded in cinnamon were very smart and didn't want anybody to know what it was in case they figured out how to make it. Um, well, there's actually ancient Greek philosophers who write all about the, the cinnamon bird and they're completely bought into this story. There is no such thing as a cinnamon bird. It's, it's the inner bark of the cinnamon tree. Um, Faraday is involved in my can of Coca-Cola um, because the process by which, so the, the, the metal I was talking about, the stuff that's strip mined in Western Australia is aluminum. Um, and uh, the process by which the aluminum is created, because I mean it's an element, right, but you don't find aluminum growing on trees. So there's no aluminum bird with an aluminum nest, right? You, the, they strip mine this stuff called bauxite and they separate out the aluminum from the, from the other stuff. Uh, and the process they use is electrolysis, which was developed by, by Faraday here. Um, this is John Jacob Schwepp, a Swiss chemist who figured out how to carbonate water. Why do you want to carbonate water? Well, you know, it used to be that the only water that probably wouldn't kill you came from springs. Springs were revered uh, as holy sites and healing sites. Um, and some spring water is naturally carbonated. So hundreds of years ago, carbonated water was a sign of good, healthy, pure water. Uh, and chemists eventually figured out how to artificially carbonate water. And that was you know, Schwepp's contribution to my, my can of Coca-Cola. Um, 
And then this guy is uh, Joseph Pemberton. He's uh, an American chemist from the sort of late 19th century. And he was one of many, I mean, let's be clear, chemist is some guy mixing up concoctions, right? These were the days of literally snake oil. There really was a thing, snake oil. It was supposed to cure you and heal you, and the guy got sued, and that's where the, the phrase snake oil comes from. Um, but it was, it was patent medicines, right? Exotic ingredients from around the world mixed up into some kind of potion uh, that was the precursor to medicine. Now, why, why was Pemberton's formula pretty good at helping you? Was it, so you had a pain, you had a toothache, or you, know, you were sick or whatever, and you took um, uh, Pemberton's Coca-Cola, and it made you feel better. Now, was it the vanilla? Was it the cinnamon? Was it that nut that I showed you from Africa called the cola nut? Or was it the cocaine? that was in the leaf from South America, which is now removed in that plant in New Jersey, the only place in America that is licensed to decocainize coca leaves, by the way. Whenever I tell people this, like, where is that place? What do they do with the cocaine? <laughs> uh, and eventually, um, the US government like wised up to the fact that these people were hawking all these things that didn't really do you any good, apart from the fact they had this addictive stimulant in them. Um, and that led to the creation of the Food and Drug Administration, which started to regulate the claims you could make about products like this. And so Coca-Cola went from being a syrup that would cure everything to a syrup mixed with carbonated water that was refreshing and energizing. I know a lady from Coca-Cola will be speaking to you later, and they, they're having some fun with the term energy right now, and health claims, and it's kind of ironic, because you know this used to be a medicine that would cure everything, right? Now it's just refreshing, uh, but that's where it comes from. So you know, Pemberton has a, has a hand in this as well. Um, but let's go back to the beginning. The, 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 the largest fleet of self-driving vehicles in the world, by the way, is this one. There's hundreds of these things. You know, it's not the, the latest Tesla or the thing you see at the car show. It's these uh, Komatsu eight-meter-high trucks that are used in the strip mines of Western Australia. Why do they have self-driving trucks in the strip mines of Western Australia? Because nobody wants to live there. It's really hard to recruit truck drivers to go and live in the middle of nowhere driving around all day, picking up bauxite. So it's actually much more efficient to have self-driving trucks do it. So it helps them reduce their labor cost um, by having these self-driving vehicles driving around. But that's, that's where we started the story, right? And then let's just review. So the conclusion, and I've given you a very brief, you know, fragment of the story of how this apparently simple, apparently everyday product is made. And I choose Coca-Cola because it's ubiquitous. It's somewhat interesting. Everybody's familiar with it. But you could tell a similar story about anything. Shoes, chairs, glass, neckties, you name it. Not just iPhones. Everything is creation. Everything is invention. And everything is a product of the whole world. If you think about the story I told you about Coca-Cola, um, every continent, apart from Antarctica, which ironically has penguins, which ironically appear in Coca-Cola commercials, but <laughs> every continent in the world contributes something to your can of Coke. And there's this huge supply chain connecting all these things, moving them around. Um, so you know, everything we use is a product of a connected world. And not just connected in space, as I say, connected in time, connected to the 2,000 generations of human beings that came before us, some of whom, like, say, Faraday or Darwin, are very well known. Others, like the slave boy Edmund, aren't known at all. No thing has one heroic inventor who did it all by himself. And I say himself because the genius heroic inventor, in case you haven't noticed, is always a white guy who's taking the credit. 
or sometimes being given the credit whether he takes it or not. But the reality is it's everybody connected. Every product in our world is a product of our world and of our species. And so as you think about connecting, think about creating, because the two are intimately related. Um, the full story of Coca-Cola is in my book, but you don't have to buy the book because you can also find it online at medium.com. It's called What Coke Contains. Um, if you would like to see your picture and you haven't done so already, you can, uh, you can either find it using the hashtag transition2015 or this is my this is my Twitter account, and if the network in the room has allowed us to, to uh, upload it, it should, should be there waiting. <laughs>